Okay. So uh, good afternoon and good evening to our friends around the world. I think there's many people um, in Asia watching us today. Uh, it's a huge honor to be with all of you. Um, I think many of you know me. I'm Jen Murtazashvili. I'm the director of the Center for Governance and Markets here at the University of Pittsburgh. And it is an extraordinary honor for me today to introduce to you um, three of my colleagues uh, who are here at the University of Pittsburgh. And all of them come from Afghanistan and they are part of uh, a project we, we are calling for the moment, the Afghanistan Project. And the goal of our efforts here at CGM, have been, the goal of, uh, of this project to resettle Afghan scholars is to preserve the intellectual communities of Afghanistan. We are not running a scholar rescue program. This is very much intentionally designed to preserve the incredible intellectual talent and communities that have been built in Afghanistan over the past 20 years. And so we are thrilled to have three of Afghanistan's shining lights with us here this afternoon. We have uh, six other scholars with us here in Pittsburgh and several more along the way. And our program here is growing very quickly to be one of the most formidable centers of Afghanistan studies in the world, really outside of Afghanistan. And it is because the people we have here today. So we thought we'd use the opportunity to share the perspectives of our colleagues, many of whom who have recently come to the United States to talk about what the situation is in Afghanistan one year after the Taliban takeover of, takeover of that country, what are the prospects for the future? Um, what have they learned? What do we know about the Taliban one year on? What are the long-term prospects for that government? And not, not just for the, sorry, government, the ruling authority, I, I spoke too soon. What are the prospects for that ruling authority? And what are the prospects for the people of Afghanistan? So often we talk about the Taliban, but we, we forget about the people who are living in that country. And so often when we focus just on groups, we forget the people who have to live with these groups every day. So without further ado, let me introduce my colleagues here. Um, first to my left, we have Hasina Jalal, who is a PhD student here at the Graduate School for Public and International Affairs. She comes to us with extraordinary experience um, all over the world. Um, she has an undergraduate degree uh, from the Jamia Milia Islamia University in India, a master's degree in business administration from the American University of Afghanistan, a master's degree in, in women and gender studies from Northern Iowa University where she was a Fulbright scholar. But in addition to her education, she has worked with so many civil society organizations in Afghanistan. She's the founding director of the National Association of Afghanistan Civil Society and co-founded the First Alliance of South Asian Women on Women's Economic Empowerment, Social and Cultural Rights in Sri Lanka. Uh, she's also worked in the Afghan government. She served as the director of donor coordination program management directory, directorate at the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum. And she also worked at the administrative office, the OAA, at the, president, uh, the Afghan president's office. Second, we have uh, Mohammed Khalid Ram Ramizi, who is a research scholar here with us at CGM. And he is the chief executive officer of the Afghanistan Economic and Legal Studies Organization, a leading free market think tank in Afghanistan. And he's been working for liberal democ democracy and the values of a free society since 2009. He's also the founder and senior fellow at the White Assembly, a leading nonprofit organization that has worked in 19 provinces Af in Afghanistan with more than 10,000 members to educate and promote an ideas of liberty and oppose radicalism among youth. He's also the founder and director of Silk Road Online Radio and TV, Afghanistan's first online educational radio and TV station that is promoting and educating ideas of liberal democracy and free society in Afghanistan. And, and last but not least, we have with us Dr. Omar Sadr, uh, who is a senior research scholar with us here at the Center for Governance and Markets. Uh, prior to his arrival here, he was uh, uh, assistant professor of political science at the American University of Afghanistan. Uh, he's the author of numerous articles and a very well-known public intellectual in Afghanistan and 
um, overseas. And I should say the recent recipient of the uh, 2022 Best Book in Social Science from the Central Eurasian Studies Society for his book, um, Navigating Cultural Diversity in Afghanistan, uh, which is a really important book and really addresses uh, these topics that we're going to talk about today from a theoretical perspective, a philosophical perspective, but also from an applied empirical perspective. So congratulations, Dr. Satter. Um, so I'm going to begin the conversation just asking each of our panelists some questions about where they think Afghanistan is going right now. And I know, uh, Hasina, it, it has been a very tumultuous past year uh, for all of you uh, who have, you know, are from Afghanistan who have come to join us and what has surprised you most about the way the Taliban have ruled over the past year? Um, thank you so much, Jen. Uh, it's an honor to be um, among all these distinguished uh, scholars and colleagues of mine um, at the University of uh, Pittsburgh. And thank you so much for the audience for joining us uh, at such a beautiful day when you could be out uh, taking a walk or um, drinking coffee with your friends. And, and thank you so much, uh, the online, online audience from all our, around the world. Um, it's really difficult to answer that question with one or two um, specific answers because I would say I was shocked the day the Taliban came um, and I saw their flag on the presidential palace where I worked for one year. And we worked really hard. That was my first government job. Um, I was fresh out of college and I was one of the very passionate young women who wanted to bring a change. And, and that was precisely why I decided to join the government, <clears throat> work at the president's office. And I remember our team would work until 9 p.m., 10 p.m., which, which is very unlikely in the Afghan government to stay that late uh, and work. Usually people get done by 4 or 5 p.m. So seeing the flag on uh, top of the presidential palace was the first shock that I really didn't believe what I'm seeing. And because I was away from Afghanistan for the past two years before uh, August of last year, uh, it was really showing how things have changed. And from that day, it started. And although there was some talks about ta Taliban 2.0, Oh, and Taliban changing have changed, and they have their um, uh, girls, for example, go to schools or universities, are getting higher education outside the country, and um, so there was they were trying to uh, show some sort of a, a light in the darkness that we were all expecting, and we were panicked about what's going to happen, and are they going to beheat everyone? There was a huge panic that. We all saw uh, through media and we experienced through our own families. Um, but that was proven wrong. The Taliban 2.0 in this past one year was completely a lie, a fake propaganda that they were trying to show to the world that calm down, we have changed and we are gonna gradually bring positive change and we're gonna work towards economic independence, economic development, um, social integration, peace, and, and so on and so forth. What shocked me the most was that all the promises that they made in Doha agreement, and when they first captured Kabul and Af Afghanistan started ruling, was put in a lie in the past uh, one year and, and so. Because they didn't make any economic progress, they didn't uh, fulfill their promises uh, of uh, uh, respecting human rights, respecting international human humanitarian laws and human rights laws, uh, allowing Afghanistan women, which is more than half of the population, to be active citizens, to have a say in the social, economic, political spheres of the country, decisions of the country, to at least allow the girls to go to school, which is a fundamental basic human rights. And what shocked me was that who are advising them and why are they making these very stupid decisions mm -hmm. over the past one year? Um, and so I think that was the main uh, shock that, yes. Yeah, and you know, along those lines, um, Khaled, I was wondering, you know, it was in March of this year that, that the Taliban uh, sort of reversed its decision. They were, they were supposed to allow girls to go to school after the Navruz holiday in March. And 
they reversed the leadership, reversed that decision. For, for you, was this the most shocking decision that they made over the past year? Uh, thank you so much, Professor Jennifer, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it is really a great honor that today I am here and talking about all these important issues about my country of Afghanistan. Uh, to begin uh, with, with answering of this question, uh, 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 I would like to mention, as Hasina also mentioned somehow, that none of us we were thinking to to Afghanistan became on on such situation that much soon, or uh, uh, or, or, or or to we lose all our achievements and everything we did in last. 20 years uh, this much soon. It is really painful that uh, today we are talking about the achievements, about the hopes, about the things that really everyone wish to be or wish to have on their homeland or on, 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 on their country. But today we lost a lot of things, a lot of achievements, a lot of uh, all kinds of freedom and uh, 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 a number of other important things that we all should have as a human being on our life. So to now answer this question, uh, if you expect something good from someone and if they do something bad for one time or two times, then you will be shocked. So th there are such people, they are, they are ruling the country, and they we experienced, so when, when they were in Afghanistan from 1996 until 2001, I was a, a student in, in school, and I know that, that uh, I still remember that what they did for the country, what happened for, for, for every citizen of Afghanistan on that time, and everything was wrong from, from their side. So the thing that they are doing at the moment on the ground for every citizen of Afghanistan, they totally ban girls from going to schools. They totally ban females from working outside of home. And a lot of other issues which, which, which they are not respecting for human rights at the moment, uh, it didn't shock me because I was thinking that this, and I was sure that these people once they come to power, they will do everything that, that, that they want. To be honest, they are, they are saying that these things are, are, are belong to Islam or belongs to our religion. And you are doing these rules or you are uh, doing these things based, based on the Sharia law or based on the uh, Islamic laws, uh, which is completely wrong, which, 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 is, which is totally wrong. Uh, th th that's why uh, that even it's still whenever I'm talking with colleagues or friends and in some conferences, I'm saying that the work of institutions like the institution, like the think tank that I was leading and still I'm working somehow with them closely, is very important at the moment in Afghanistan. If we give them the opportunity, they will do everything that they want, but there should be a resistance, we need some resistance so they could fight with their gang against them. And we need some kind of other resistance so we could fight with our ideas. And fighting with ideas, based on my opinion, is more important than fighting with, with a gang. We can bring a lot of changes by, 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 by our ideas on the ground. And Afghanistan is one of those countries which, especially the young generation, they are accepting the new ideas, the new opinions. When Afghanistan collapsed, I was very disappointed, especially about our wars, because I devoted about 20 years of my life to promote the ideas of liberty on the ground on, 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 for every citizen of Afghanistan. I deal with my life. I face with a lot of life threatening challenges, but I accepted all of them because my mission was to promote these ideas, humanity, for every Afghan citizen. And I was very disappointed to we lose everything, we lost everything, and there is no hope for the future of the country. But after two months, I received 
oil, oil escape from Afghanistan to another safe place, but after two, we closed our office in Kabul and in all, all the cities, but after two months, I received more than hundreds of emails, messages that follow. You extended, you invested in, 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 in our capacity building in, in us, and now we are here to, to, to defend from the ideas that we learned from your institution, from your thinking. So what I want to say that after that, I realized that the seeds for freedom, that the seeds for prosperity of the country, that the seeds for liberty of the country are already on the ground and they can do much great works. And that's why we accepted to we should continue our voice for freedom of the country. So I didn't expect it to, to, to be honest because I totally know that they will, they will do everything uh, 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 in the country. And just as last point that I would like to mention, is that before Taliban was very united among themselves. So for example, they had one leader, they were saying that we should ban this thing on the, on the, on the country. But now they are very, very separated among themselves. For example, we had the experience that in fact, your, their leaders announced that the girls' school mm -hmm. should be open. But even in Herod, we have the experience that, that, that they announced that girls can go to school. Even in, in Baal, which is one of the northern provinces of the country, all these things show the Taliban, they are not united this time among themselves. They are separated among themselves. But again, they are ideally as close to each other, but somehow they, they, are, they are acting in different ways. Uh, yeah. Okay, great. And I, I want to talk a little bit more later about how your organization still manages to work inside of Afghanistan. Omar, um, you know, as a as a political scientist, um, you know, looking at the future of Afghanistan, the Taliban rule, it's one year later. I've asked the others about what surprised them the most. Um, has there anything, has there been anything? I, I know that you 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 have looked at the organization um and your writing for many years warned us about Taliban rule. Has there anything that has about the Taliban rule that has surprised you, perhaps in a positive way, um, or in a, in a negative way? Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, glad to be here. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, so I'm, I think first of all uh, we have to understand what is Taliban as a the religious uh, fundamentalist movement. Uh, so far in the literature, um, there are divergent ideas about how, how do we understand and describe Taliban. Um, and let me highlight some of them. Number one, there's an idea that Taliban is representing um, the real Afghanistan, which is majority of Afghanistan, rural area, traditional, tribal, representing some sort of conservative religious views. And um, this idea was unfortunately relevant and the Biden administration. And um, according to Biden himself, say that we can't unite Afghanistan for simply this country was fragmented. Our nation, of, our mission of nation building has, has, has failed, and we are no longer no, no longer there to do this, this job. And hence, let's relinquish the country to the real forces, um, which are the of course the Taliban. Um, that's that's number one. Second, an alternative perspective may say that Taliban is a proxy of Pakistan. Uh, and as an insurgency, they were hosted, sponsored, trained, and centuries uh, which were across the border in the northern provinces of the Pakistan. Um, without logistical and financial support and the network that Pakistan provided for the Taliban, the insurgency was not able to fight um, the NATO and other teams over 20 in the Western nation. This is not a simple linear process where Pakistan simply put money, for example, let's say, in the pocket of some mullahs and asked them to fight. It's a much more complex and organic process. As you see, this started from the politics of Cold War in 1980s, where, where a lot of um, Houthi, Arab, and plus Western funding came to United States, came to Pakistan in order to nurture what was earlier called uh, freedom fighters. Uh, as a result, a network of madrasas, which were all uh, linked with the very traditional conservative reading of Islam 
Ubandi Islam in South Asia were financed by the politics of Cold War. Um, that transformed and transformed what we have now Taliban as one segment of those freedom fighters of 1990s and even. Uh, so hence, there is a systematic link between um, Pakistan as a Taliban and uh, the Taliban as a, uh, a proxy of uh, Hence, that may not also kind of explain what Taliban is. A third fact, a third explanation for the Taliban is that Taliban is also not just a proxy, not only a representing tradition of Afghanistan, but also ethno-nationalist Pashtun who um, who cherish values and preserve the idea of ethnic majoritarianism as you may see and the way that the, the, today's authority of Afghanistan has shaped the politics. Um, well, we don't have real data on the ranks and files of the Taliban and that data is not also segregated. What, what matters is not the number percentage of people to what extent they are coming from a certain ethnic group. The important is as their ideology, the ethno chauvinism and ethno nationalism, which defines the way politics of the, of the Taliban is applied in Afghanistan. That includes um, uh, a sort of politics which is exclusionary, uh, not in terms of share of power for certain people, but also in terms of um, meaningful presence of diverse, diverse cultures, diverse ideas, gender. Um, ethno racial groups. Um, so, uh, so, in that case, a third explanation is that one. What we know about Taliban is knowledge of past three decades. We are dealing with Taliban not just recently, but it has been this is the group which has which emerged in '94, and since then, in different manifestations and avatars, as an insurgent, as an incumbent uh, government and authorities has and shaped the politics of Afghanistan. However, throughout the last three decades, the Taliban has transformed very less uh, in terms of their constancy and in terms of their ideal, how they imagine an Afghanistan. Um, the, how, now, what, what, what you see now is the Taliban decision-making is rested with a, uh, with a minimal small circle of clergy um, who has the final say about some of the critical national issues within the country. And that includes uh, certain public provisions of morality, um, how the society should be remodeled and reshaped. As a matter of fact, the Taliban does not care about um, the main function of a state, which is provision of services. Rather, they are um, highlighting the importance of uh, morality in the society and, and, the, and the fact that the state is responsible for propagating and preserving certain form of public good and public morality. Uh, so this is the same way that you observe now the Houthi days of, days of protest in Iran. And this protest was triggered by, by the incident with morality police um, arrested and held eventually um, a young lady. You see the same thing happening in Afghanistan. Uh, the morality police in Iran is not much different from that of morality of police of the Taliban. Um, it might not be a surprise that it is three foreign institutions which are all controlled and administered by clergy of the Taliban to run this morality, more public morality and morality police. Those institutions are number one, the top leadership of Taliban government, Amir al momini which is himself a mullah, a clergy. And second one is the Supreme Court of the Taliban, which is run by a highly conservative uh, Maulawi, which is coming from a Jubilee Madrasa, the Hakim Akani. The third institution is a uh, Ministry of Justice, um, similarly, that's also ruled by um, another clergy. The fourth institution is Dar al which is an Islamic political system. Dar al is an institution which gives um, the final verdict or judgment about certain, like as a matter of policy, like policy decisions and And finally, one is the Ministry of um, uh, 
uh, more virtue and prohibition of uh, vice, vice, vice and propagation of virtue, um, which is the, I mean, the, the armed police of Taliban to implement whatever provision is given by the Amir Nurmani, Dara Nasra, Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court. Um, so, if that is the case, I think we are not much surprised in terms of what Taliban are and uh, and how they will shape the politics, and also whether we should expect any change or transformation or not. People still think that um, those who think about the transformation of Taliban, and again, that could be categorized like this to me into three or four camps. Number one, there are people who think that Taliban should be eventually moderated to engage with them. Why? Because of the practical purposes. Once Taliban realize that they cannot govern and they are dependable, uh, dependent on, on an Indian community, hence they will trade off certain things. Trade off, I mean, in exchange of foreign aid, humanitarian aid, recognition, um, they will also put some cost of consistency on the table. Uh, that's, that's, I think, predominantly in the Muslim perspective about how to deal with the Taliban. Um, secondly, uh, some all, some people also think that we can only transform or probably defeat Taliban, not just by for public protest, but by finding out, identifying moderate, secular, nationalist Pashtun. Because Taliban are coming from the Pashtun constituency, and so we need an alternative from the same constituency, which is Pashtun. So that's why they are trying to find that. Region. This is also another. I mean, um, a formula which was practiced earlier. President Karzai in the 90s was such kind of figure, a moderate, secular, uh, non religious person. Um, unfortunately, this, this solution will perpetuate the same sort of ethnic hierarchy and, and will not address the core of the problem. You're replacing one constituency with another constituency uh, without addressing what are the key causes of the conflict. And finally, I think the last solution, as I have uh, <laughs> spoken long, is as the constituency who thinks that Taliban should not be defeated only with um, uh, non violent movements, but we do need, we do require um, maximum pressure, which should be a kind of on resistance against Taliban. Because you know, as uh, totalitarian regime, the Taliban is one of them. Cannot, cannot be defeated or fragmented under two things happen. Number one, an espresso from below, bottom up. Society should stand up against the regime, what's happening in Iran. If they cannot, they don't have uh, But at the same time, that's not enough. Um, these regimes will also be vulnerable if there's a fragmentation from the top. I mean, the political elite and the ruling, ruling party, now the Taliban. Now, people are investing much on the, on the last factor, which is fragmentation of the Taliban, dealing with the moderates, investing on these group of people. However, there's no evidence to show that there is a crack uh, at the top leadership of the Taliban. Uh, they are full in control. Even those who are proposing certain moderate ideas within the Taliban leadership, they do not question the legitimacy of the system. They do not question the leadership. Or the structure, it's just minor changes that they may demand. Um, so, hence, um, I, I think we are facing quite difficult scenario now if this is the case. Uh, there's um, a small resistance going on, uh, there's no fragmentation at the top leadership of Taliban. Mm -hmm. So, the prospect is a bit dark for me. To me. Very dark. So you know, along those lines, and I, I think you've already sort of addressed this question of, as is the question of international engagement. Um, and I want to ask this question to to both Khalid and Hasina. But you know, when I look at the Taliban, where I see the key difference, where I see I do see Taliban 2.0, but I see Taliban 2.0 not where other people see it in terms of ideology. I think this Taliban is actually very different from the one that came before, and the fact that it really believes in state capacity. Uh, Omar laid out the ways that the use of ministries, the use of ministry of justice, courts, Supreme Court, uh, building a clerical hierarchy. We didn't see Taliban 1.0. It, it was almost like the state didn't exist. Ministries didn't exist. They didn't need the state. Um, but this Taliban really believes in 
coercive capacity. Maybe they've learned the lessons from the previous mistakes they made. Um, and it is an effort to really consolidate power. And I don't know if you agree with that assessment of this Taliban being in it. No, I'm going to come to you later. Yeah. Uh, but if if we believe that this is the Taliban, right, that it's, it's a stronger Taliban, it's a more united. As Omar said, there's no cracks in this leadership. Should there be? How should the international community engage with this group? Is it possible to engage with the Taliban to foster changes in terms of education, Girls in, in Afghanistan are the only ones in the world that are not allowed to go to prime or forbidden from going to primary school. This is highly unusual. Um, and it's not just the girls' issues. There's uh, you know, a, a genocide taking place against the Hazara minority. Uh, there's targeted attacks against the Tajik community, retribution against people, anybody who served with the government, especially former military. Um, how do you engage? Do you engage? What strategy should the international community pursue in order to affect change and also you know, addressing the wide scale poverty that we continue to see, the economic catastrophe? It's a big question, Hasina. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, before answering that question, I noted down some of the points that really um, I would like to come uh, briefly address with what my colleagues um, John and Omar John shared here. Uh, I really liked when you said the resistance through our ideas. And I would like to add to that that the real resistance in Afghanistan and the most effective resistance in, inside the country in the past one and more than one year uh, has been through um, Afghan women's, um, Afghan, by Afghan women, led by Afghan women and uh, completely independent of any outside international support. And that is something that we should acknowledge whenever we talk about resistance and whenever we want to talk about bottom up change from inside the country. I think it's really important that we acknowledge, recognize and appreciate what Afghan women have been doing in the past uh, one year and what they're going through and what are they paying, um, the, what price are they paying in, in um, uh, in, in, in the, uh, in the, and the courage that they have. Um, second, when we talk about the nature of Taliban, which Omar here really nailed it by explaining all the different views on Taliban. But I think it's also equally important that when we study the phenomena of Taliban or like the, this insurgent group, whatever you want to call it, the de facto authority, right? They were an insurgency for us up until last year, August 15th. The youth of Afghanistan who grew up like myself in the past 20 years, we didn't see them as a, as a group that could govern the country. We saw them as a group that's fighting against our government and not coming and negotiating, not breaking a peace deal. And to be honest, the, the majority of the Afghan population, more than 65, between 65 to 75%, which is young people, they never recognized this group to, to eventually become the rulers or the de facto authorities of the country. It is important as we study and talk about who Taliban are, we shouldn't only, I think, focus on whether really the Taliban has changed who they were and who they are and make that our main argument or main point and factor for whether we should engage, what is the prospect for the future, what needs to be done. Because I, on the contrary uh, of what a lot of people believe that it is the Taliban that's making decision and it's the Taliban that has the power and the authority that is doing what they're doing right now in the past one year in Afghanistan, I don't believe that. I believe Taliban, like any other insurgent group around the country, uh, we, I, I, in this, nowadays, I'm reading a lot of literature on violence and order around the globe. And when you compare a group like Taliban with other groups, you see that they always have a source of support, a place where the, the, the real decisions are making or being made and so, something that we don't talk about. So instead of focusing all our uh, our focus on who Taliban is and how they can be transformed, if they can be transformed, if we need to transform them to engage with them, I think we need to focus on how did they come to power 
who is supporting them? Where is the international and regional consensus on, on working with them, engaging with them, make them change? I don't believe that Taliban by negotiating or by talking to them or by uh, you know, engaging with them in a very secular, very civil way, they're gonna sit there and accept what we're saying to them. Especially when it comes to women rights, when it comes to human rights, things that they didn't grow up. They, most of them were hiding in the past 20 years. Most of them were not inside even the country. They didn't get the education that we did as the Afghans. They, um, so it's very hard to make them change at this stage when they are in power and expect that they will change. Instead, I think the international community should focus when it comes, when the question of engagement comes, they should focus on where is the international consensus? In past month, I was with a group of Afghan women inside the US, part of a delegation where we went and um, had a round table with 15 permanent representatives uh, to the UN and had some bilateral meetings with US at UN, UK at UN, and what we were, and most of these PRs were uh, uh, from the Security Council. What we heard uh, continuously as a response from the uh, PRs of different countries um, uh, working on Afghanistan at the Security Council was that it is not us that we don't want to bring change. It is these other countries that don't believe in what we believe and what you as Afghan women are advocating for. And we try to, for example, meet with Russia PRs or at least their office at the working level. China, they have been um, they have been completely rejecting that in the past one year. They don't want to meet any uh, Afghan civil society group or Afghan woman. And inside the country, we see how from the very beginning when Taliban came to power, they started supporting Taliban uh, in different ways, uh, investing the private their like Chinese private sector started investing. Russians, you know, try to bring them to uh, different tables. And while Afghan women and intell intellectuals and civil society organizations, they are not, they don't have the freedom to travel around the world. Some of us, we don't have the, the freedom, the right to go outside the US or travel because of the legal restrictions. Taliban, a group that we saw them as an insurgent group living in the mountains, got immediate indirect recognition by these big powers and countries. Uh, so I think that's very important to uh, to to uh, to discuss. Um, and uh, for example, we see, we saw last uh, couple of days that the uh, embassy of Japan opened in Afghanistan. I think that is important question to be asked. Instead of how we will transform the Taliban, which is in my belief, it's very hard. It's not going to happen in this generation. They're not going to transform because we are telling them that these are not the right values, these are the right values. Instead, it's important to ask the Japanese government, while Taliban did not uh, did not fulfill any of their promises, they didn't even allow girls to go to schools without any legitimate logical reason. I grew up in Afghanistan. I went to the same public schools. Our schools were gender segregated. Our teachers were, girl, were women. We wore the Islamic hijab. Uh, so there is no Islamic logical reasoning that they have, but still we see these regional countries, these international powers supporting them in different ways at the Security Council, at inside the country, outside. I think that is the more uh, important topic or a question that we should be asking. So along those lines, if you're a neighboring country, right, if you're China, uh, if you're a Central Asian Republic, Iran, Pakistan, of course, you're looking at the past 20 years inside of Afghanistan and many, you know, Russia supported the United States, China supported the United States efforts inside of Afghanistan for many, many years. Mm -hmm. I think people forget, um, you know, all this discussion about Ukraine and NATO and, you know, Russia fighting against the United States and the West because of NATO advancement. Russia welcomed with open arms two American military bases on the territory of the former Soviet Union after 9-11, both in Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan. So uh, there was broad international support for the, what the international community was doing inside of Afghanistan. But now, if you're one of these neighboring countries and you're looking at the situation there, you see 20 years of chaos, fighting, 
the North became heavily destabilized, which was once sort of a bastion of peace in Afghanistan. You're one of these Northern countries, you're China, you're worried about the Uyghurs mm -hmm. and a potential Uyghur insurgency and, and radicalism and so forth. So perhaps their strategy is let's contain Afghanistan. We don't have to, we, we worried about these gender issues and all of this, and that seemed to cause more, more chaos mm -hmm. than stability. And if you're a neighbor, you want trade, you want peace, you just hope that the Taliban can, you know, maintain political order mm -hmm. and not be too, not be too rough, mm -hmm. you know, not use too much coercive force, just enough to maintain stability. So uh, this is another way to think about international engagement. Is this a wrong approach? I want to ask Khalid this question. You know, how if we think about the neighbors, if we think about the United States, if they're looking at stability. Yeah, this is a very difficult question, but... I will try to answer based on my experience and based on my knowledge. Uh, in, in Afghanistan, uh, we have two kind of views. Let's, let's talk friendly. <laughs> One is the exact news or the real news, and the second news you are you are saying Afghanistan uh, chow. It means that the news of of of, of the square, the news of the street, and uh, most of the people in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, they have a lot of ideas in politics. And w when you are talking with each Afghans, Professor Jennifer, you were there, I'm sure that you, you know what I'm saying. They have a lot of things about different ideas about US, about Russia, about China. And uh, uh, when I was there also in Kabul in Afghanistan, and when I was very young, even when we were participating in some kind of family, Parties, everyone was talking about politics. Oh, US came here, they are doing that, and China is, 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 is doing that thing, Russia is doing that, a lot of these things. But later I, I, I came to know that uh, although all of all of their things is not true, but at least 50 percentage of the things of the ordinary people about the politics of Afghanistan is also true. They are saying the truth because they experience a lot of things on the ground. They experience Mujahideen, they experience former Soviet Union, they experience Taliban, then they experience liberal democracy with a lot of freedom, with a lot of opportunity, and their mind is completely open. And in the United States, I asked uh, one of the Uber drivers asked from me that, where are you from? I said, I've wanted from. He replied to me, Afghanistan, where is Afghanistan? I didn't know that there is a country under the name of Afghanistan. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting for me. Even two, three times this happened for me in, in Pittsburgh. But in, in, in Afghanistan, everyone knows a lot of issues, a lot of things about, about politics, about what's going on. So to be honest, uh, we, are, we are one of the most bad country in the world that we don't have good neighboring countries. All of them in each period of time, they wanted to interfere in our internal issues and they wanted to do something bad for our country. They are not real friends of Afghanistan. If you see the, if you read the history, if you see the recent news about Afghanistan, you will understand that we don't have good neighboring countries to, to, to be helpful, to support. Afghan people and at least their face so at least we should have sustainable peace and prosperity in the country. Um, although this is a very, very difficult question to, to I should answer it exactly. Uh, but based on, on, on my uh, experience, but based on my uh, knowledge, uh, I would like to say that yes, there are a number of issues, a number of things from all parties who were involved in at least in the last four decades, big deals about Afghanistan, uh, that they also wanted to create different scenarios to we should be or to we should experience the situation that we have at the moment. There are a lot of things that, unfortunately, I'm not able to share everything. 
because my colleagues are working on the ground and I'm engaged with a number of institutions on the ground. But to be honest, yeah, the world is also not too much honest. They were not too much honest for Afghan people, and still they are not too much honest with Afghan people. When I'm thinking about the Doha Agreement, so the Doha Agreement was the first step that they recognized Taliban. They gave them the opportunity to they could, uh, uh, take actions as a how to decide. They, the agreement made them to, to be more powerful and act as a real opposite side of the government. Uh, they, they didn't consider the voice of the people, the ideas of Afghan people. They went there and signed the agreement with, with, with a few mullahs that they don't know even what is humanity, what is human rights, what is human rights, what's education, how even you, you could watch yourself. They don't know. But they signed the agreement and they give it a country for them. So all these scenarios, all these things, it's very painful for me. My health is not good since 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 the collapse of Afghanistan and the symptoms became very worse. I went and visited the doctor and the doctor told me that you have the most bad kind of anxiety in your body. And if you don't control it, you will face with a lot of other challenges to control it. So every Afghan who has a kind of feeling for their country, who has a human being think about their homeland, their situation is not good. All of us are experiencing this, this problem with Israel. Because the world, and especially the neighboring countries, are not honest still, and they were not honest with at once. So, uh, given the challenges, is it possible? You know, from what I'm hearing from all of you, that the situation is almost untenable with the Taliban, that the neighboring countries have their own interests, they're not honest. Is, is the only path forward an armed insurgency? Omar, do you think that that is the only way? Uh, let me quickly sure. have a remark about the earlier point you made about uh, the change in Taliban with respect to mm. the perspective about the state. I don't observe such kind of transformation. Mm. Um, but uh, I may say Taliban has become more politically rigid in state. Taliban's perception of state has been the same as 90s because of a, an, as an Islamist movement, Islamist movement always aimed for establishing an Islamic state. Yeah. The concept of the state always has been there at the core of Islamist movement. The ultimate jihadists are not for the sake of anything else except to um, ultimately establish a universal state. Now, Taliban, of course, they do not want to aim, do not aim to establish Khilafah, but they have accepted the national state system. Um, but but they do not see a fundamental shift when it comes to how they want to. What is the perception of the state uh, from Taliban standpoint? What is the function of the state? Uh, and how it should be administered. The function, as I said earlier, is for, for public regulation and morality, and how it should be administered, only the ones who are clergy, they are they have the legitimacy to run the state. The, the, these two patterns existed in the 90s, the same existed mm -hmm. now. Now, in terms of efficiency of functioning the state, now there might be a, a difference. And this is what I meant, is that they, they really believe in the effective state control, building intelligence services, not that the ideology has changed, mm -hmm. but they, they are much, they're much more interested in this than they were before. Yes, so this also still, I do not see that a Taliban hardcore member has learned how to run the state. Rather, the efficiency that we observe now is based on some auxiliaries who are now working for the Taliban. For example, what has been left from the previous republic, obviously majority of that public uh, mm -hmm. bureaucracy left the country, but still I have been in touch, for example, with the leadership of the Ministry of Finance and, and the Taliban came and they didn't know what to, what to budget. Why budget is required for a state? Literally, they didn't know the state. But then they were, they were, Thought, okay, well, this is this is not how to do it safe, mm -hmm. and, and you need to learn these things. They, because as an insurgency, they how they were distributing and collecting revenue, everything was cash. 
there was a democratic system in the world. The same mentality is still existed. Now, however, the branch of Taliban who have been close with the establishment of Pakistan have been trained on how to run the state. You will see them much more organized and free, particularly, for example, the Afghan network, who grants uh, uh, a bunch of ministries, but particularly in the interior affairs and free. And so you see them much more efficient. Um, Still, I, I may think now in terms of practice, efficiency has a little bit is better compared to 90s, but the perception of Taliban, even with respect to efficiency of the state, has mm. not changed. So there is there's change in practice. That's also because of the pressure, global pressure. Also remember that in 90s, Afghanistan was abandoned. That was literally isolated. But now there is continued pressure to, to, to deliver on efficiency of the state. International communities and teaching and mm -hmm. engaging with the Taliban for the new purpose of efficiency of the state. Yeah. Yeah. So what I would what I would just you know want to push you on is what I where I see this is not necessarily on, like their change is not on like the service delivery, mm -hmm. but instead on the use of coercive capacity, uh -huh. like the intelligence army. That this is something that they really understand. Mm -hmm. Of course, they they wanted this before in the '90s. It was in the ideology, but they couldn't get their act. They were too busy also fighting others. They didn't actually have the same kind of established peace in the '90s. They were still fighting in the north and other parts of the country. This time. It's really about consolidating power. Mm -hmm. There's power ministries, the police, the security forces, intelligence. Mm -hmm. That I think is where they, the real difference mm -hmm. from 20 years ago is like this, uh, you know, using the intelligence forces to go after people. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course they did this before, mm -hmm. but the precision mm -hmm. that they are using, the cruelty that they are using, yeah, yeah. of course it was there before, mm -hmm. but it was also an insurgency. Exactly. It's, uh, it's history matters. History of 90s, the way Taliban evolved, and history of 2021, the Taliban evolved, impacted them. I mean, Taliban in 90s evolved out of a civil war, which means that they didn't have cohesive, even uh, as, a, as a movement, they didn't have cohesive structure. Fragmented political parties came together and called an alliance with named Taliban. Uh, now, I mean, at this moment, uh, the Taliban had an, uh, an experience of uh, de facto authorities in 90s, plus long 20 years of insurgency, plus they also inherited an estate structure from the republic. Uh, so nothing was, I mean, they didn't come in 90s, they came in a civil war wherein their state structures didn't exist. Now they, there exists something. Yeah, um, anyway. I, I'm sorry, I forgot the question, the, the real question. Is no, it's okay. You know, I just wanted to, we have just about a half an hour left and I thought we could open things. You answer the question anyway. Um, what we, was about the insurgency and what the future is. Is it is it an insurgency oh, or yeah. something else? But maybe we could open things up to our audience. Uh, I have a comment about oh, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, uh, on your question about if um, the international community can trust the uh, current de facto authorities to bring stability and order in the country, given that, as you said, they're much better uh, with their military tactics and intelligence service. I would say uh, from, a, from a human rights perspective, from the person trying to um, uh, not talk for, but uh, bring up the perspective of the majority of uh, people of Afghanistan who are inside and outside the uh, the youth and the women and and the um, uh, ethnic um, different ethnic uh, people, uh, I would say many people would say that 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 would be a wrong approach if the international community uh, invests on the current de facto authorities, thinking that past twenty years of war has ended because the war has not ended and this is just a transition period and the war. Is ongoing, but it's I, in my view, it's gonna. It, there is a possibility of even civil war, and the emergence and the, the growth of other um, groups such as the ISIS and and other terrorist groups we already saw and we have been hearing. I think uh, so. Political stability only by supporting and engaging this uh, de facto authority, I think, is not the right approach. Uh, it should be a give and take. The negotiations, for example, when the Japanese embassy opened up. What did they in uh, in um, uh, when they opened their embassy 
what they got from, from the Taliban. Like, did they let the girls go to school? Did they give some of their uh, main important uh, ministries to the non-Pashtun uh, ethnic uh, uh, people, Tajiks? Did, do they have a commitment? What, 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 was, what are they saying about the uh, Hazara genocide, about the Tajik genocide? So I think uh, when international community talks about engagement in, in Afghanistan with the de facto authorities, they should make sure to understand that um, these people only by themselves, they don't have the expertise and they don't have the long-term commitment and uh, knowledge and skills to run a state. Uh, with the military and intelligence, in my view, it is not only them, but they're getting support from outside countries, 100%. We've been hearing this um, and, and um, from, from different sources from inside the country. I think so it's important to not only rely on these de facto authorities and say this is the only solution for Afghanistan stability, but instead think of ways to bring change if they, if they accept the change, if the de facto authorities accept to include other ethnicities, to respect human rights, to allow girls to go to school, and so on and so forth, which is, I think we have a very long way to go. Uh, hence, the international community should be very, very uh, careful of their engage engagement. The engage engagement should not um, give a sign of recognition or a sign that we are making the current uh, situation inside the country uh, a, a new normal, and that this was the solution for the two, 20 years of war inside Afghanistan, which is not. The majority of the people of Afghanistan inside and outside don't believe that this was the solution. In fact, they believe abundant. They, they believe that they're in the most um, critical situation in the history of Afghanistan, both from a humanitarian and economic perspective and crisis, and, as well as the human rights crisis. Can I add something? Thank you. Uh, maybe my idea is somehow different than my respected colleagues, but I would like to share what, what I have experienced. Uh, the engagement uh, with Taliban, to be honest, we, we, we started about a decade ago. So it is a long time. I'm, I'm very well aware about the peace process that UNOMO was leading and a number of other international issues were talking and leading, and I was also involved on those issues. So we, we, we had a long-term engagement with Taliban. After the collapse, uh, and after a few, a few months, I was also very disappointed, and I was not in favor of engagement with Taliban, because I, I, I was thinking that uh, it is good to, we should push them as much as we can. We should fight with them. We should have resistance against them. But then I realized, Let's 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 be honest with ourselves. That United States, all other allies of United States, they are not in favor or they are not interested in another war in Afghanistan, right? And also in the meantime, in the country, although we have a lot of resistance every day, because we are controlling media, we don't have any independent media on the ground. We have a lot of resistance in different provinces of the country. Every day there is fighting, there, uh, there are a lot of things which, which is going on against them. But then I realized that so, the international community, they leave us alone. The resistance, although we have a lot of resistance, but they are not too much strong to fight against the equipments that remain from United States and other countries and now the Taliban, they are using that, and they have a lot of facilities. Then I thought with myself that the engagement with these groups is, is one of the important things we should consider. We should push them, we should force them to accept human rights and other international documents that we want to, to they should consider. And what I did after my engagement through our institutions, through our think tank with them, which is still operating. Which which is still we are operating. That's very yeah. surprising. This is this is very yeah of course. How is it still operating? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at the moment because I think this is shocking yeah. that a that a think tank yeah. is still working. At the moment we have uh, the the civil society organizations, the NGOs are uh, registered in Afghanistan in two ministries: the Ministry of Economy and the Ministry of Justice. After uh, 
four months ago, they thought they announced and they totally closed all the issues, all the associations, all the civil society organizations that they registered in Ministry of Justice. So we don't have any any other associations under those names, and they totally removed even the structure from the ministry. The only thing which still remain is the NGOs who are working, uh, were registered as the NGO and with the Ministry of Economy. And they are somehow respecting them in, in different ways. Because before I was thinking to, to share that, the new Taliban, they are, they are really, they, they are also interested in money. They, they really love, they, they really love money to, to, to get <laughs> money from different sources. But in previous, as, as, I, as I have still in my mind, they were, they were somehow different. But now they are working very hard to get money, get funding from different ways. And one of the resources that they see is the NGOs because they have funding. So at the moment, we have 121 NGOs as the registered NGOs that were working in humanitarian issues in, in the country. They are giving foods for people, they are giving blankets and all these stuff. But there are only two NGOs uh, as a think tanks that they are working on the ground. One is my organization, mm -hmm. my think tank, that we are working as a liberal think tank on the ground, which is very difficult at, at this period of time. So I, I was talking about engagement. And now I, I would like to connect the, ter the engagement with, with this authoritarian group. After two months that the government collapsed, we were thinking that how we should operate because the people uh, message me, the people has from us that they are ready to work with us. We have to continue our fights because the seats are already on the ground and we should not give up that much soon. And I was thinking to, 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 uh, to, to think different ways that how we can operate, how we can reopen our office because these people will come and they will uh, capture all my colleagues, and again, we will face with other problems. Latif, my colleague, is here. He just arrived to Pittsburgh last week, so he knows all these things even better than me because he was on the ground and he was experiencing every minute that I'm talking about that. Then we went to the NGOs department, and we talked with them. We got the engagement. We talked with them that we are this institution. We are working about these ideas. We are promoting these ideas based on the religion of the people. This is the book that we produce. These are the seminars or the conferences that you are working on that. We are not converting the religion of the people. We are not converting the culture of the people. What we want to do is a, to have a better economy for the country and also to have some, uh, to, to, to enhance the knowledge of the people about these ideas, which all of them are based on Islam. Then they said that, okay, we will talk. We will, we will see that what we will do, but everything should be based on Islam. Then we thought with ourselves that let's brought changes in our policy, in our mission, in our vision, and remove the words, which is very difficult for, for them to accept it. Then for example, we remove the term of the word of liberty, the word of freedom, and these words that they are not accepting. And we reship. What do you? What words do you use? Prosperity, for example. Yeah, <laughs> in a very tricky way. And instead of freedom, we are using prosperity. We are using for prosperity. We are using for a better economy of the country. And also, we are connected. We are connecting in every words Islam, and 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 we uh, uh, reship our strategy to we should produce a number of books. Uh, for example, Islam and economics freedom and Islam, all these things. So we should do it first. And then we convince them. They accept it, which, which is very good, which is, which is something positive. And they said that, okay, you can open your office, but everything should be, should be based on Islam. And we said, okay. So now we are taking care of, of, the, of the title of our program, the title of our books, but our agenda, our works is completely the same that we were doing on, on previous government, but we just shape it in, in, in different way. So in, in case of engagement, I was thinking, as I said earlier, that we should push them, we should, we should fight them, we should fight with them, we should create a lot of resistance. But uh, I get a good 
experience in terms of engagement. So what I want to say and what I want to request from all of us, from all of us, from all our friends in, in US, we have a very big responsibility. And our responsibility is that we should use every tools that we have. We have pen, we have ideas, we have every platform that, that, that's available for us. To, we should use it on the way to this authoritarian regime should know that how they should respect for the people, how they should respect for the women rights, how they should respect for minority groups, and how they should consider other issues. I'm not 100% sure that it will work in all scenarios, but at least I am somehow hopeful as I get a good experience from them that there will be some changes as the world leave Afghanistan alone. And if we also leave the country alone, then they will do everything that they want. So we should use our forces, our ideas, our strategies to work with them in different ways and convince them and force them to at least respect for our ideas somehow. So uh, I know I promised we would put things up for questions, but I, I there's a point of tension here I want to push on a little bit. I mean, Omar, do you think that Khalid is being naive? That that this engagement that he's in he's trying to embark on to change to move things sort of from the bottom up is is realistic? Is is he just being is his organization just being used? by the government? Is it giving it some kind of legitimation? Or do you think that this is an approach that other people should try? Well, I think I, uh, to understand um, civic engagement in a authoritarian context, one has to look at the different types of these regimes. There were, a ha I mean, in, in political science literature, um, for a long time, scholars assumed that an economic opening will transform political system in, in China. That didn't happen. Uh, one of the key reasons that it didn't happen is the nature of political system in, in China, which is totalitarian. And authoritarian systems, an open liberal economy may transform the political systems, but not in a totalitarian system. Now in Taliban, I think it's very naive of liberals who think that, well, uh, such kind of engagement with the Taliban uh, will transform ideology. Taliban will not compromise on certain values, which are, I mean, as a preconceived for them. Um, if you have civic engagement, there are certain, I mean, prerequisites for civic engagement to fulfill the end goal with as an open society, uh, wherein you have to talk without being afraid of your ideas. The Taliban put certain conditions on these issues, so you function just as a as a, as, as any other kind kind of I mean uh, enterprise for the sake of paying people and earning some funding from a donor. But to what extent what you produce and say is uh, I mean substantial in terms of con content? I, I doubt that really. The Taliban will not; they are not as cool to allow whatever is uh, whatever is said there. Uh, there are red lines for Taliban, and that matters for them. No one can compromise those, those red lines. Um, so there, the possibility of dissent is less. And if there is a transformation, yes, there should be non-violent civic resistance, but that will not lead to transformation until and unless that is not coupled with um, other measures uh, which force Taliban. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, and then we open just, up just one time. minute, just yeah. just very briefly. Uh, I, I would like to mention that, that that we are working with 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 a lot of challenges, with a lot of problems. Just two weeks ago, they captured my colleagues in Badakhshan province. We we organized a very big events, and they captured. So that's that's what I said before that they are very. Where uh, are they now? Are the, they still in jail? They were uh, in jail for more than three hours. They investigated from all of my colleagues in different ways, and my colleagues are very well prepared to how answer to the, how they should answer the questions. The, the, these problems can happen every minute. Even they 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 came to our office. They are checking. We can't invite. We can't have our female colleagues at the same time in our office. So all these things are our biggest challenges. But what I want to say that if we leave the ground, 
This, that's not good. We, you can't do anything online via Zoom, via other programs. The presence on the ground is something very important. This is one thing. The other thing, we are not working for Taliban. We are not there to educate every Taliban. But you have to understand what is liberal democracy, what is human rights, what's women rights. That's not our mission. Taliban, if you count all of them, there will be 70,000 people, or let's say that 80,000 people. But we have 40 or 36 million people who are living on the ground. We have to work with them. And the things that you are doing at the moment, and that's why I'm saying, which is very important, that we are using Taliban as a tool to we should reach to our audience. That's that's very important and that's very big. Great. Questions? And do we have questions online? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take one from the audience and then one online. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for this speech. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, my name is Kinshari. I'm a volunteer at the Disability Yeah, you can see some of the How is that the political and the Pakistan right now, like the interact with the situation in Afghanistan, the kind of influence came from Afghanistan also. And the second question is that it's Islamic state. Uh, like, if you can explain more slowly, and more easily, people who have like, more Islamic groups in Addis Ababa and other countries also. So, how do you explain some of this? So the two questions, so I can repeat in case our online audience here is, first question is about, you know, the role of Pakistan, and the second question is about uh, Islamic State, ISK. Please, ladies first. I mean, as I said about um, the fear that we have, and that's a very legitimate fear, ISK have been growing, and there is signs of uh, other terrorist uh, activities inside the country. Uh, well, in, in the absence of rule of law, in, the in, the, in a uh, uh, dictator government, it is uh, historically, if you see it, we can see this example in different countries that uh, people, when they don't have um, uh, authority, they don't have, uh, they don't believe in the legitimacy of the government, they don't uh, trust their authorities and they don't have any agency, there is no elections, there is no prospect for them, they don't see their future in a country, and there is that's coupled with unemployment, poverty, with lack of human rights, with uh, a humanitarian crisis. Uh, of course, uh, there is literature on this, there is empirical evidence that uh, citizens um, start to, you know, uh, engaging with uh, uh, different radical uh, groups, and in Afghanistan, we saw this in the formation of the Taliban group itself. For example, in the Badakhshan province where I'm coming from, um, I used to hear about uh, Tajik uh, Badakhshanis uh, uh, going and joining the Taliban like even five years ago. And that when we were asking like in terms of ethnicity, they are different than the majority of the Taliban, uh, they're Tajik and um, also uh, uh, Badakhshan province is one of the most uh, educated and one of the most, uh, um, uh, you know, historically very resisting uh, uh, society and uh, culture that we have in that province. So it was very shocking why people are joining these groups. And uh, when I when I was talking with people from, from the organizations that was on the ground, the civil society activists, what I was hearing was poverty, was um, the state the Afghan state in the past 20 years didn't do a good job of um, empowering the local governance in, in the provinces and the power was very centralized. So uh, resources and opportunities were not distributed in an uh, equitable manner. Uh, and people didn't see themselves in, in the government because elections was a fraud. So a lot of these factors, uh, you know, with, with the Taliban growing kind of among uh, other ethnicities and in different parts of the country, we see the same thing now in, happening inside Afghanistan with ISIS and the the, uh, the resistance in Panjshir and other uh, northern provinces is also another example of uh, the fact that people don't believe in the legitimacy in the uh, authority of this government, de facto authorities. Um, so that's a huge threat 
Um, and I think that's a threat. That threat should be recognized by the international community as an international peace and security threat, not just an issue of Afghanistan that will stay inside Afghanistan, that will uh, no doubt it, undoubtedly that will spread and affect the um, international stability, the regional stability, and it's, uh, that's um, I think uh, it's it's a it, I think it's a it's a very important question that you asked, and it's something that one of the main reasons why international community should take the issue of Afghanistan more seriously, and instead of uh, forgetting it, which we are seeing that. Afghanistan is not that relevant in international media, they should even focus more about what's happening inside Afghanistan. So why don't we take some questions from on, online and then we'll take your question. We'll just collect a few questions because we have about, uh, unfortunately, about five minutes left. One comment comes to one of our associates, Alan Shah. Um, just a comment, actually. I think efficiency relative to PO1 comes from the infrastructure they inherited. And then we have a question from one of our students, Nina. What do all of you want to see happen in Afghanistan in the next five years? Do you see the Taliban being forced out, Afghan people rising up, international military intervention? I'm interested to hear your vision of the country, whether that is with or without the Taliban. Great. And your question, sir. Um, hi, Robert. I'm from the Circular Security Intelligence. Um, my question is uh, you guys highlighted a lot that Islam is a fundamental. Interesting. Great. So I'll let everybody address whatever aspect of these questions um, in the time. We'll start with you, Omar. Well, on yeah. religious sentiment of the people, there's a good uh, data on that. Uh, if you look at Pew survey data, unfortunately, Afghanistan is one of the countries where, based on that data, 99% of the people desire for an Islamic state, which should be shaped based on Sharia law. Um, that is not the case in Central Asia, even in the Middle East. Afghanistan and Pakistan are one of the top conservative countries in that sense. So I don't know exactly the methodology of Q survey, but it's one of the reliable data in the world which can refer to. Um, the prospect for secularization of Afghanistan is quite challenging. Um, and I, I also believe that it, it, the nature of Islam is quite different in terms of you know, how it defines rule of religion uh, in public and politics compared to that of Christianity and Hinduism, for instance. Um, the, the particular secular model which is practiced for centuries here in the West may not be applicable in Islam. However, um, uh, an alternative uh, model which allows people to practice their religion, however, it should also open a tolerant space where no one should be allowed to impose their fundamental creed on the rest uh, should be established. And that, 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 that's the pathway towards a um, kind of multicultural state, um, which accepts diversity, but, uh, but at the same time does not allow any culture to rule over the rest. Uh, this pathway is quite too challenging for Afghanistan, given the fact that now Taliban rules. To what extent Taliban uh, rule and question of Taimina, I think that's question, not the question of how, but but when. Taliban will end the day, um, but uh, it's a matter of time. The, the longer they rule, the weaker they become. And, and that, is, that is the nature of an totalitarian system. Um, but I must emphasize that no one in Afghanistan should rely on international communities to deal with the Taliban. Um, there we had, I mean, the people there had enough experience to take help from great powers. That was a mistaken formula that should not repeat. Um, they should have, I mean, people of Afghanistan show enough resilience and agency um, with respect to their self determination, with respect to the self governance. And the current resistance, which is going on by Tajik and the women of Afghanistan and the cities. Is a manifestation of resistance that is must and that will respond in a positive manner. It takes time. We need to have patience, but at the same time, I mean, people are giving 
high sacrifices for a better society in Afghanistan. External intervention by great powers will perpetuate the conflict. Um, it will destabilize local re resilience, local institutions. It will not lead to an, um, a kind of stable, prosperous democracy system, even if it's for the good sake. Right. Khalid, everybody has two minutes left. OK, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Just about the question uh, on Pakistan. I, although I mentioned before, and I, I think I, I answered this question somehow, but regarding the Pakistan, unfortunately, unfortunately they are not honest with, with us. You know, after the collapse of Afghanistan, just after two days, the collapse, the head of OSI, he visited Afghanistan in a, in a very different way, just so he was the person that he was trying to appoint people on the government of Taliban, on the regime of Taliban, and he was the person to, to, to do a lot of things for, for these people. So all these evidence, a lot of things, their embassy is active since, since the day of the collapse. They are working actively. They are, they are visiting with all the leaders of Taliban and a lot of other issues. All these things now and since before, we know that they are not honest with us and they are trying their best to, to, to destroy our country in different ways, in different uh, points. About the Daesh, about ISIS, uh, what uh, Ms. Uh, Jalal said, I'm, I'm completely agree with her. That's why I said that we need resistance on, on the ground. And the resistance should not be only a harmed group. The resistance should be ideologies also. We should, we should fight with our ideologies too. If the world leave Afghanistan, and if we don't give the hope for the people of the country on the ground, be sure that Afghanistan will be the most safest place again for all terrorists, not for ISIS. Because there is a big land, they have everything and they can do everything. And Afghanistan will be the, the biggest threat for, for all the world. We have to consider this and we, that's why we have to continue our fight against them. Tamina said that what we want to see, how we want to see Afghanistan. Uh, based on, on my opinion, as Dr. Seb Omar said, the Taliban will be finished. Hopefully very soon, or maybe it will take some time. All these scenarios in the world are some kind of game. If you are playing video game, you will know. So everything will be finished very soon. Maybe they, today or tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. They will finish. Be sure that we have to remember this room and my face and all these things that we said today. <laughs> but uh, they will be finished. But if, if Tamina asks from me that what you want, how, how, what, what you will do, I will answer for her that the only option to fight with these people, although I, I talk with, with about, about, the, about the engagement with them somehow, that, which is somehow helpful, but again, I'm sure you can do something, you can bring some changes by engagement, but you cannot change completely the mentality of uh, such group by engagement. So I will tell for Tamina that resistance, resistance, resistance. And the only way for the future to see a bright and a open and a free Afghanistan, a prosperous Afghanistan, is resistance against these people. The last one, I'm, I'm sure that we don't have time. <laughs> so the people, as, as, as you said, brother, that, uh, can we see Afghanistan as a secular? No, this is not possible. Uh, the, the Afghan people, they experience a lot. We experience secularism, we ex experience a lot of things on the country. What, what we want at the moment is a logical freedom based on the opinion, based on the beliefs of the people. So in last 20 years, we have all, we had all kinds of freedom and we were very happy with that. So the women were able to, if they wear a scarf or not on the streets, they were able to go to schools, they were able to go to works, they were able to travel freely in all parts of the country. And that's enough for a country such as Afghanistan. And we were very happy with that. But now the people they are experiencing, they are watching by themselves. 
that they don't have any kind of freedom. And, 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 they, are, and they are regretting that why even they didn't support Ashraf Ghani, for example, to keep all those achievements or to keep all those freedom. I, I heard a lot of this from, from my friends, from my colleagues. So what we want is not a secular Afghanistan, not we, the people, if, if, we, if, we, if we talk, and we want all kinds of freedom based on the framework of, of, of the people. Thank you so much, and I'm so sorry I talked too much, although I'm sick. <laughs> Um, I will be very brief um, on the question about uh, what we want to see. Uh, I would like to uh, first let me respond to the question about Islamic values and if people or the society is gonna perception is gonna change and they would like to tend towards more secularism. That is something that we have to leave for the for the time to see. But in my view, in the past 20 years, Afghanistan was an Islamic society. The constitution was one of the best written and Islamic constitution. The laws were uh, Islamic and uh, we, we were functioning with the Islamic values. The version of Islam that these people are now imposing on people, on Afghanistan, on Af Afghan people of Afghanistan is, is not the true uh, uh, Islam. That we should first recognize, because when we compare the situation of women of Afghanistan with the neighboring countries, I would say even with, with Pakistan and Iran, the situation of uh, women of Afghanistan is the worst. First, we should recognize the gender apartheid that is taking place in Afghanistan, the genocide of the Hazara communities, the targeted attack uh, against the Tajik uh, uh, people. Uh, so I don't want to divert uh, in that, but about Islam, if the Taliban understands, and the Organization of Islamic Countries, together with uh, um, uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with with advocates, uh, U.S. Uh, for example, consultative Afghan, U.S. Afghan consultative mechanism, and other uh, major umbrella advocacy and lobby groups, have been trying to make them understand that what you're doing is not Islamic. This is an interpretation that you have come uh, up with, and your clergy, which is mostly in the Kandahar, and they're not educated on international laws, on anything other than that very restrictive view of Islam is not the real Islam. And that's what we are advocating for. If women of Afghanistan can get the rights that women in Malaysia and Indonesia has and, and other Islamic countries, that is that is the short-term goal for now. Um, on what what we want to see in Afghanistan, I think we need to be realistic in the, in the short term. I think recognition of gender apartheid, Tajik and Hazara genocide in Afghanistan is very much important recognition of all the discrimination, all the violence, all the atrocities that is happening um, by all the uh, major security council and human rights council and major countries, neighboring and regional countries, not by only so-called Western or democratic countries, but everybody should recognize what's happening inside Afghanistan. Um, I think the resistance of people of Afghanistan especially women in Afghanistan and organizations, um, uh, if it's think tanks or non-profit, non-government organizations, or even people who are surviving and trying to make a life in Afghanistan should be recognized and should be appreciated. What organizations like um, uh, like what uh, Khalujan was saying is doing inside the country, I think the impact of that we will see in the, in the longer term, and that's tremendous. Today itself in the morning, I was talking with a friend of mine who, who, who is in Afghanistan and she runs a non-profit. And she was telling me that some of her family, closer family members and relatives were taken a couple of days ago. And I woke up with this voice of hers, uh, literally like explaining that she's not been able to sleep for the past week and that's why she was not able to get back to me. Uh, that's the reality. It is not easy to work if it's on, on humanitarian work or gender, uh, sorry, girls education or any um, mandate that the Taliban is allowing it's not easy to work inside of. So that is uh, uh, what we really appreciate. And we, uh, I, at my personal capacity, am trying to support and help and advocate for organizations and individuals who are inside the country and in the neighboring countries in Central Asia, South Asia to uh, raise their voices and, and help them and support them to, to really continue that bottom up civic resistance. And I think that's what we want to see in the shorter term. But in the longer term, I believe, as I said, that trusting, uh, on this uh, de facto authorities and thinking that they will bring stability in the region, war is over in Afghanistan. That's an, I think that's not the 
the the realistic and the 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 true um, uh, perception, and that should be challenged because I think in the longer term, people of Afghanistan, the 75% youth, will not tolerate and will not. They're not tolerating now, but I think there will be an appraisal if this these de facto authorities they don't change their uh, policies, and I think they're not going to be sustainable by what they're doing. And that's why in the beginning of my um, conversation, I said that who is advising them? What they're doing is is not at all smart of them. So I don't think in the longer term they're gonna um, continue the way they are ruling. And I hope that we. Um, all the people of Afghanistan from inside and outside with the support of the international community. I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, focus or I cannot uh, reiterate the importance of the international pressure and international consensus and regional consensus on the matter of Afghanistan, because no matter what we do from the inside and from the outside, we advocate and we resist. And if the neighboring countries, if the ma major uh, world powers continue to support this group by financial support, by recognition, by different ways, our resistance, our um, advocacy is not going to uh, uh, make a big difference. But that doesn't mean that we should take the agency of Afghanistan people from them and say that the, the decisions should be made only by the, uh, by the outsiders and the international community. So with that, I just want to thank all of you for this. Thank you very much. Community online, thank you for your patience for our community here in Pittsburgh. Please know that we have these wonderful colleagues here. You're welcome to reach out to them, speak to them anytime you want. I know they'd be more than happy to engage with you um, as you think about the future of Afghanistan. So we have another event coming up in two weeks on the economy in Afghanistan, featuring three more of our scholars uh, who are working on uh, economic issues. So watch out for that notice two weeks from today in this room, I believe. So thank you. And thank you, Brian. And Aditi.